Welcome to the first session of the Startup Buzz series, Emerging Areas for Startup Investment. Today, we have a special address by Ms. Paula Mariwala, founder, uh, partner, Oriolus Ventures. And uh, the session is moderated by Mr. Ninath Karpe, uh, our uh, chairman for CI Western Region Subcommittee on Startups and Entrepreneurship. He is uh, also the founding, founder and partner of 100X VC, a VC firm. Uh, Thank you. Thank you all of y'all for joining in. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Harsh. And uh, lovely to have you, my good friend Paula, on this uh, uh, Startup Buzz. It's the first for this uh, year at CII. And we hope uh, we'll have many more. But it's great to kick off with uh, a session with Paula, who's really been a pioneer in uh, many ways. She's, of course, the founding partner of Aurelius Ventures. It actually, it's a very interesting venture. It invests in innovative uh, startups and companies focused on social or an environmental impact. It's a very nice, interesting space to be in. She is founder and president emeritus of Stanford Angels and Entrepreneurs India, the managing director of Seed Fund Advisors and promoter director of Hinditron. I'll stop it at that uh, because I can keep going on. But fundamentally, she brings a rich experience of investing in early stage companies in India and US. She has truly been a pioneer in this space in India. And she's hoping to may have a deep impact across uh, fundamental aspects of mobility, healthcare, education, climate, and sustainability. Some of her uh, key investments include Una Academy, Pixel, Cello, and Terra.do. She's an alumnus of Stanford University. She lives in Mumbai and sits on multiple management and advisory boards of companies and foundations. We couldn't have got a better person uh, to talk to us on a topic which is so interesting. Uh, and uh, we thought we'll kick off this series this year with this topic of emerging areas. So that sets the context for the rest of the year. And we know then based on what Paula is saying, what are the topics we should discuss uh, for the rest of the year. So I'll jump straight into the topic. Paula, thanks again for joining. Uh, and we are delighted you are here. What are the promising emerging areas? Simple words. One, two, three, four. <laughs> well, thanks, Dilat, firstly, for having me on your uh, first series. Uh, always a pleasure to be with CII and uh, the audience here always has good questions. Uh, and this is really a good topic, uh, Dilat, as you rightly said. Uh, you know, the last year has been a bit of a turmoil as far as the VC world and startup world is concerned. One has heard of um, the startup uh, and uh, you know, investment winter and so on. So it's a good time to introspect and see where really we are going to get um, really innovation and uh, growth from. Uh, you know, the playbook for the uh, investor has changed over, I think, over the last one year particularly. I think during the pre-pandemic and pandemic years, there was a lot of focus on um, services around the consumer tech and the consumer. Um, and a lot of money came into uh, funding companies which were really serving consumer needs, consumer services. We also saw a lot of investment, particularly post pandemic in ed tech and in health tech, overall in digital transformation and using uh, you know, this digital transformation to bring uh, access to a large uh, cross-section of, of consumers. Since uh, the pandemic, I think there's been a bit of a change in the rules of the game. What happened, uh, uh, and I'm going to just take a minute to talk okay. about the past before I come to the one, two, three, four of the sectors. Okay. Uh, you know, I think what happened is because a lot of money flowed in, uh, there was a lot of focus on just uh, capturing the consumer and giving access and not really focusing on, um, uh, if I may say, efficiencies of capital utilization. So one talked a lot about large losses, whether it was in ed tech uh, or whether it was in, in uh, you know, food services or other consumer services. But uh, as we have seen, this is not sustainable. So I think um, that this coupled with a lot of external circumstances has you know, made us look at very many new sectors which have emerged. For example, India was never really known and VCs were definitely not known to invest in manufacturing. Uh, but today I think I would put manufacturing as a number one emerging sector 
for um, Indian startups. Now, why would I say that? Manufacturing is, you know, one would say capital intensive and takes a long time and it's maybe, you know, business for the banks. Uh, but I think it's a sector waiting to be disrupted. Uh, for many years, nothing new has really happened, particularly in the Indian context. A lot of the manufacturing happened from China or Southeast Asia and so on. But because of the geopolitical circumstances, which has sort of changed the equation, and also because of, of the government's push of made in India, there has been a definite um, a pull for staff, for founders, to look at innovation in startup, in manufacturing. Um, also existing uh, manufacturers realize that, uh, you know, in this changed world, one needs to have a lot more efficiencies, a lot more uh, digital transformations, a lot more energy efficient uh, processes. And there is a full shift across sectors uh, to sustainability, right? So there is a need to completely relook at the input which goes into manufacturing and the kind of products also that come out. ESG is such a part of all major corporates that there is, it's definitely needed to be disrupted. So a lot of startups have, and, and you know, also with new uh, tools like 3D printing and many other um, innovations that have come because of IoT and so on. I think manufacturing as a sector, I would put it as a number one surprise sector. Uh, in the emerging, uh, uh, you know, sectors that we are talking about. Uh, you know, one has seen a company like Zetworks, which has become a unicorn. Uh, one could really not imagine a VC-funded company like that. Uh, similarly, we have funded a company called Karkhana, uh, again, which is looking at uh, innovative ways of designing, prototyping, and manufacturing at scale, many different products. So this is completely... Uh, opened up a new, new, uh, uh, you know, canvas, so to say. Um, lots of IoT companies uh, have also come in as uh, services for uh, B two B services for this sector uh, to improve productivity. Alongside uh, the manufacturing, the number two sector, I would say, which goes sort of hand in hand, is uh, supply chain and um, uh, logistics and warehousing, because where you know, if there is a shift in the way manufacturing works, then these uh, sectors are definitely required. These sectors, supply chain and logistics, had already had a strong push after the boom of e-commerce and other consumer services. Um, and I think with a lot of new technologies coming in, robotics, etc., cetera, uh, warehousing has also seen a lot of new entrants, a lot of new startups which have done well. Um, I think um, uh, supply chain and warehousing also a lot of new ways of doing these things. Again, um, sort of sustainability being at the core of it because one is really focused on, on sustainable materials in the supply chain as well as doing logistics in a more um, sustainable way, more energy efficient way as well. So across these sectors, uh, there has been a big a uh, big wave of new interest in, in the startups. Um, alongside, I would also put mobility. Uh, you know, India is, of course, one of the largest markets, emerging markets for EVs. Uh, EVs are being used for transport and logistics, also are being used for, for transportation, uh, a personal as well as, as public. Uh, we have seen in Bombay, for example, a lot of uh, Buses coming, which are EVs, a uh, lot of companies are looking at pushing EV vehicles. All this requires a different set of companies to support. So EV infrastructure has become another big uh, sector that has come. Um, new technologies in batteries are definitely required to support this. Um, so again, as a corollary to this, uh, if you put it in a broader perspective, it is uh, decarbonization or electrification. Uh, which means alternate energy, uh, alternate storage, and so on. So that is another big chunk um, that investors are looking at to fund, uh, which may take a little longer, but it is definitely here to say. Again, our government has been very supportive uh, in pushing uh, EVs, in pushing mobility. Um, we have a company called Chalo in our portfolio, uh, which is actually digitizing public transportation also getting in EVs in uh, you know working in public private partnerships so these are again very emerging sectors i would say because while transportation has been around one has not seen this kind of innovation coming in so i would definitely put uh, 
these three. And a little more, uh, to add a little more fun to this, I think um, gaming is uh, and Web3. I don't know if I can say it today because after all the news we've had about the taxis uh, that they've been burdened with. But if you see, I mean, the kind of um, interactions people have with games is completely changed. Uh, whether it's Dream 11 or with, and sports or whether it's so many online gaming uh, platforms uh, that have come up. And along with this is, you know, immersive technologies, right? AR and VR, which were sort of esoteric, but they're now being mainstreamed. A lot of uh, devices are coming in. So um, I'm going to stop at these four. There are, of course, the usual suspects of, of you know, health tech and fintech and uh, edutainment and so on. But I think these four are kind of, very different, uh, differently emerging sectors in India, particularly. Oh, fantastic. That's a great list. Uh, so participants, if you have a question, uh, please straight away put it in the chat because I'm going to take it as it comes. And I'm intending to wind up this entire session by 4.40 or 4.45. So it's going to be a very brief 40 minutes. But Paula, that's a great list. I want to, you know, you made a comment in passing and I want to just get to your two minutes more attention on that. And you said that, uh, you know, there has been a lot of focus on consumer and not efficiency of capital. You made a, That's a very loaded statement, but you made it in passing. And I want to push you a little bit on that. See, the fact is that India is a deep consumer market. Uh, you know, the domestic market has got so much depth that uh, startups uh, by, you know, their intuition, they want to do something which is, you know, possible and easily doable, which is uh, focus on the consumer. Uh, so is that changing? Are we, you know, you mentioned about manufacturing and and I don't want to talk about deep tech now, but uh, the consumer market depth and domestic market is going to be there for a long time. No, you're absolutely right, Nanad. I don't think I want to take away from the consumer, uh, uh, the potential for, for the consumer market growth in India, because we are a large economy, we are a growing economy more than anything, and we are going to continue to consume. I think where I'm coming from is that a lot of money went into consumer, um, various consumer tech, consumer services, and so on. Uh, but today, can we live without, uh, you know, our Flipkart or a Swiggy yeah. or a Zomato or what have you, right? I mean, we cannot. So that's actually embedded. However, yeah. let's look at how the funding has come there uh, and how you know, it is still being supported by capital uh, coming in. They're all looking now, uh, let's say even a Nika, uh, they're all looking to profitable growth. So that's what I meant by the focus was not on capital efficiency. And to be fair, I think it was required because we that's what gave us the non-linear growth. I think the difference is that uh, in today's uh, environment, we cannot keep funding a company for many, many years. Uh, just to fund its losses for getting customer acquisition. I think the customer acquisition costs will come down. Okay. The access to capital will be more rational. And hence the growth will maybe not be as blazing as it has been, but it will definitely, I mean, maybe instead of 400%, it will be 100%. But it will continue to grow. Uh, I think there are many D2C brands which got built. Again, they disrupted a very established FMCG industry, which... Uh, if I was talking a year and a half ago, I would have said that's an emerging sector, the need to see brands. Uh, but I think uh, some of that playbook has been played. The reason I talked about these sectors is that the way we, uh, VCs or you know investors are looking at uh, investments now are models which will give you paths to profitability and uh, will have a more focus on uh, unit economics. Because I think one realizes that, you know, one cannot just have endless pool of capital uh, fueling a company. So that's that's the reason I'm sort of from, uh, talking about uh, these sort of B2B segments, because that's where I think the VCs are trying to balance out the consumer game. So, so those keywords, investors remember, Paula said, paths to profitability is important and unit economics. So keep that in mind before investing. We have a first question from Bhavik Thakkar. Simple question. Any thoughts about PropTech? Yeah, no, PropTech is, again, a, a, a really good segment. Um, you know, we have seen this grow quite a bit. Uh, the uh, 
real estate markets have grown uh, and the way i think consumers view ownership of property is, is changing is there some noise or? there's an echo let me mute my disturbance um so i think proptech uh, you know i think there is a few companies which are looking at uh, uh, you know sharing of properties i think that's uh, a good investment class uh, i think there is uh, also uh, just as airbnb came up so many others came up for for the sharing economy so it's definitely a growing segment uh, as well there is a question and let's get the elephant out of the room because it was to come up in any case ai <laughs> there's no conversation yes absolutely i was waiting uh, for you to ask me the question uh and i wanted to take ai as as a technology trend rather than a sector trend yeah. so ai is of course all over ai is actually one of the longest standing technologies i think nenad you will remember uh at least when i was doing my grad school ai was still already around and that was many many moons ago uh but i think today it has really come of age and ai by itself is not loaded i think the the loaded is particularly um uh, you know the regenerative ai chat gpt that is really put it into uh, sort of the uh, you know domain of uh, the lay people um i think what we there was there's always a question that if chat gpt can do everything why do we need anybody to do anything i think the way we are looking at this is as investors or as founders the way we should look at it is this is giving us a very powerful tool so either one can come up and one can invest in new proprietary training models which will actually create new algorithms and new um sort of models of ai uh which can give a, a, a you know a different direction to say let's say decision making and so on or we can use the regenerative ai as it is existing and it is so so very uh, sort of mature now that it's almost cookie cutter that we can use uh, this as an application tool and layer it on let's say health tech uh, ed tech come up with new language models come up with vernacular models so um, i think lms learning management systems if they get interspersed with uh, these regenerative ai models or uh, health uh, you know gets um, gets um, a layer of ai on top one can write prescriptions one can have early diagnosis couple that with machine learning ai ml is really uh, the buzz word uh, you know machine learning is nothing but making ai sharper right get the machine to learn more with more data so when you layer existing models whether it's in health whether even in property whether in hr is really taking uh, some very interesting uh, models using uh, ai um edtech of course is also uh, you know completely changing how uh, one views education but if you layer this i think there is a whole new uh, bunch of um, applications which will come up and a whole new host of companies which will lead to a lot of personalization Uh, a lot of localization by localization i mean you can really take a uh, very very uh, vernacular not just language but vernacular flavors and have them mainstreamed because now you don't need to have a special software it will all be done uh, with the same tools uh, and then at the back of this there is a lot of need for new types of data so then again those back end services companies uh, which will be pure tech companies will also come up which will partner with let's say large healthcare providers and so on uh, to come up with uh, very very refined um, solutions so uh, i think it's a it's a great um, time to be in technology i think uh, ninad the you know this takes for me back to when the first internet came right and uh, there were models which failed and there was a lot of exuberance but eventually it all got really so mainstreamed and so many new companies came out of this right even though some companies failed in the 2000s and so on uh, but this will really lead to a lot of new innovation across so i think vertical saas with specific ai will come up in a big way uh, across sectors whether it is um, prop tech whether it is health um, whether it is uh, other enterprise collaboration tools uh, whether it's languages 
uh, a new company I just saw, you know, they are calling it um, uh, AI enabled social commerce uh, on WhatsApp, right? So AI will actually determine where you should buy, what you should buy, how, and you know, you can just use WhatsApp with language, with any language you want. Um, and it will be like your assistant to, to take you shopping. So all kinds of things will emerge. Some will stay, some may not stay. Uh, but there's certainly going to be a change uh, that's going to happen. So Paula, I've got a lot of specific questions. So, you know, uh, just let's... Let uh, me take the one on defense and space, uh, right? On deep tech. Yeah, be brief because, you know, I'm getting a lot of questions on specific sectors. You know, yeah, so I'm going to take deep tech as a sector, whether it's defense, whether it is space tech, whether it is uh, medical devices. I think deep tech also as a sector in India was never a favorite of, of us VCs because there was no early adoption. I think uh, some of this is uh, changing. Uh, in our portfolio, for example, we have two space tech companies which have done exceedingly well. Uh, there are space tech launch companies. There is companies which are giving data, which is being used for climate, uh, which is used, being used for defense. Uh, in defense, again, defense with manufacturing, you can actually, you see a lot of Indian companies doing things in this, um, and there is capital available for this through government as well as um, elsewhere. Uh, I won't go in deep into it, but uh, definitely is this is also a sector that is getting attention. Maybe not as much as some of the others, but it is definitely getting attention. So three sectors, there are specific questions. We see appetite for defense. Then there's another question in the Q&A on uh, opinion on shared economy and gig economy. Yeah, so defense, like I said, you know, I think uh, defense is partnering with a lot of small manufacturers. And again, this ties in very well with what I talked about earlier in different manufacturing technologies. Uh, defense prototyping has become a big thing that, that is being funded. Uh, and like I said, space tech. So it's definitely there are two or three VCs very much focused on this uh, particular thing in defense. So I would say it is definitely a good sector. Um, in terms of shared economy, gig economy, uh, I think this is here to stay. Uh, we have seen shared economy scale across uh, mobility, across um, across things like, um, uh, of course, Airbnb and so on, but also in things like uh, sharing of uh, accessories or personal uh, devices, personal clothing and so on. Uh, and that is also going to continue to grow as People want to consume more without, uh, uh, you know, being conscious. So in circular economy, this will grow. Uh, gig economy, again, in uh, has grown a lot. Um, uh, we have seen companies um, where gig workers are available at, uh, you know, even for a small project of like 10 man hours, you know, it's, it's become very, very common, the gig economy across creatives. Uh, one of the other growing segments uh, is media and gaming. And this is what is really feeding uh, into the new gig uh, economy. A lot of uh, creative people are using gig economy platforms um, for this. There are also a lot of gig economy tools or collaboration tools which have come up uh, in globally. And I think they are being adopted in India as well. But in India, I think pure gig economy of sharing uh, just talents and resources is definitely uh, coming up as a solution for a lot of uh, HR needs as well. So let me kind of get into, uh, let's move away a little bit from sector. We can come back to it because the topic is that, but you know, you, one of the sectors you mentioned and you were very excited about was gaming. And that brings me to the topic of how important is weightage do you put on regulatory framework for how important should investors put, not you? I mean, what is your advice to investors? Investors should put on weightage for regulatory framework. For example, in FinTech, we have seen, you know, every couple of months, uh, something coming up and, uh, you know, it's altering uh, investments and models and people are trying to do something around. Now, suddenly uh, we saw 28% GST on gaming. Uh, Web3 companies, you know, a lot of them, uh, not pure Web3, but more on the uh, blockchain crypto space are not finding, uh, you know, favorable uh, regulatory environment. And interestingly, you mentioned uh, mobility in which you mentioned that government's uh, support is important. So 
what weightage should uh, pe uh, investor give to regulatory framework and its fluidity? No, I think it can make or break, right? A sector or your investment thesis. Um, in sectors, highly regulated sectors, like we've seen in fintech and early on, we really struggled with fin fintech. Honestly, till uh, the India stack and UPI came along. But even after that, I think uh, uh, there has been a constant struggle. Um, I think the government really needs to take cognizance of the fact that these are dynamic sectors and you cannot have uh, retrospective legislation or uh, burdening of taxes, uh, which can completely destroy a very, very much a growth path industry like a gaming industry. Uh, I mean, uh, frankly, I don't have investments in, in a gaming company, but I know a lot of uh, companies, I know a lot of young people who are passionate about making games, right? And it has actually led to a pretty thriving industry. Uh, it's absolutely uh, illogical to suddenly thrust this tax. I think there should be a lot of collaboration uh, with with the, you know all the stakeholders, right? The government should call them to the table and understand how and when to put these kind of things. You cannot have a complete blind spot and then suddenly burden. Uh, this is, you know, if you go back to, uh, why was there no space tech earlier? We always had a pretty good, uh, you know, ISRO and all were pretty good, but there was a regulatory change that happened, which has also actually helped, uh, for example, space tech. Um, in case of gaming, in case of fintech, even in case of EV, right? Again, there has been back and forth in terms of mobility. Um, wherever there is private public uh, involvement, the government has a right where there's a public goods involved, right? So an RBI steps in uh, to manage or to monitor fintech is somewhat understandable. But to just put on a tax because an industry is doing well, when you have completely ignored it early on, and a very high substantial tax is not good for the country, not good for the government, because it does, it will result in gaming companies moving away uh, and they will find pastures, green pastures. The government needs to be nurturing towards innovation and entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurs will take risks. Sometimes maybe they are not in line with what the government expects. I think best way to do it is to have a dialogue have industry associations like a CII, have representation um, and take cognizance of the fact that there is a reason that this industry has done well. There is a demand and we have the supply. You know, we are able to uh, have people who can make these games. So I think rather than uh, just painting it black, it's extremely important to have a consistent policy. And even if there is going to be a change, it has to happen gradually so that the uh, companies, entrepreneurs, uh, and all the stakeholders have uh, the ability to adjust. Uh, we have seen, uh, and you know, I'm going to be bold and say this, in China, we have seen what sudden change in regulations did. I don't know whether we want to emulate something like that, that you suddenly say we don't like the way certain companies are growing. Um, the companies are growing because there is there are people who want that service or that product and they are able to give at a price which is acceptable. So sure, I think one should tax profits, but there has to be a, a rational way of addressing this. And for investors, we are always cautious when government is a customer. Typically, VCs do not fund companies where government is a major customer because one is always scared as to government changes and then, you know, things will change. But now, as a, if you want to support a sector, you must have a confidence that the government policy is going to be rational and most importantly, consistent. So uh, does that mean that we don't take bets into sectors which are new? That's what the message we are getting, that wait for the government to give clarification before you invest. That the new opportunity window goes. Some Japanese Korean company will come and take it. No, no, we should do that before uh, others come in. So, participants, if you have any questions, uh, please. <laughs> uh, there's a YouTube channel as well. If you put it there, my colleague from CII will send it to me. 
but uh, please do put your questions. Uh, we will wind it down next five, 10 minutes. So don't miss this chance. Paul, I want to ask you again a general question. And then again, I want to go, get back finally to sectors before I get back to sectors. How important, how important is the concept of scalability when an investor invests in a startup? Look, when we uh, <clears throat> invest in a startup, of course, we look at the founder and the sector, uh, and we have an overall idea that this is a growing sector. But the particular model that you are investing in, whether that model itself can scale uh, and scale non-linearly, as in, you know, not just incrementally, right? Not uh, a 6% growth kind of thing, right? We need to see adoption at scale. So by scale, I mean, let's say you, if you start off with 100 users, it should quickly be able to go to 1,000. I'm not saying 100,000, which shows that there is a demand at scale. Uh, there is an adoption which can happen. Um, and if you can't see that scale, uh, there must we must understand the reason why the adoption is not happening. Is it because of regulation? Is it because the product is too complicated or too uh, unaffordable? Let's talk about a sector which scaled very rapidly, let's say ed tech. Pre-pandemic, there was scaling happening in ed tech, but there was a huge amount of scaling that happened. There was a huge amount of adoption that happened. Uh, and now while we may say that, okay, it's not going to grow, there are some problems, but I think it is here to stay. I think people have adopted and the scaling has happened. It's a large market. Sometimes very large markets also don't scale very well. Uh, for certain companies, right? If your products are too complicated or uh, the business model or the revenue models are not very clear. Uh, so scale is important. For example, in health, I would say there was a lot of scaling during a pandemic, uh, but health per se is a little bit difficult to see scale because we don't have a very robust insurance system. So as a as a country or as a community, we are not very uh, conscious of preventive health. Whereas if you see health companies in the US, they scale very rapidly in preventive health. Uh, and we don't have a, a sort of a big insure tech sector. I should say that this is a great sector that investors are looking at, but we are looking for regulations here. If we can really have favorable regulations in insure tech, we will have, and I'm hoping that with the new schemes of the government, this will happen. But health, which has taken a long time to scale, can scale rapidly. But scale as a, for investors is a very, very important uh, factor. Typically in two years, first two years, you understand this company is not scaling. So either you pivot, uh, the most popular word used by startups uh, and investors that, oh, no, we are just going to ask them to pivot. So model which scales, because we need to see growth. And why do we need scale? Because, you know, unless we get that scale, uh, we are not going to be able to have um, an exit. We're not going to be able to show that this is a true disruptor um, well, in whichever sector. So your matrix can be different, but whatever matrix you are tracking, uh, like in case of a lot of the consumer companies, it was just the number of users, right? The number of uh, orders you are getting. Whatever you are tracking, it should scale. If it remains flat, then it's a good business to have as a maybe a profit generating business, but it's not a scalable business, which can give us great IRR on our uh, investment. So there is a follow-up question on manufacturing. Any subsectors which you're excited about in manufacturing? Uh, yes, uh, in manufacturing, I think I did mention uh, EVs, which have, I think right now, there's a big lead uh, in EVs. But besides that, I think we are seeing um, even, for example, Apple is coming to India. Uh, devices are going to be made, which will go into there. So I think electronics is going to become big. Where there is a sudden spurt and an unexpected spurt is also in, let's say, chemical bio manufacturing, where uh, there is a shift towards natural or recyclable ingredients, uh, this concept of biorefineries. Uh, use of agri-waste uh, or other um, natural uh, inputs compared to, uh, let's say, petroleum products. So that, I think, is another subsector. Sustainability is a leading um, 
a growth in manufacturing as well. So again, um, you know, for example, uh, even in textiles, uh, different materials are being used to replace. I mean, I just saw a company which is using hemp and pineapple fiber and all kinds of rice husks to make uh, clothing. So I think garments, that's another uh, big one uh, that's happening. Sustainable materials in general, I think, uh, is, is a big one uh, that is uh, coming up. A um, lot of um, design-led products. So whether if it's even um, in FMCGs or <coughs> um, other um, uh, sort of design-led products are um, furniture, for example, I think a lot of that is happening, which was all China manufacturing. A lot of that is shifting interior designs. Um, I mentioned fashion. I mean, a lot of that is happening as well. Um, so I think a bunch of things, you know, uh, companies like Mama Earth, a um, lot of the uh, people who sell on Nika and so on, they are doing local manufacturing for costing and transportation. So small manufacturing is happening. Uh, platforms are coming up where you can go and, and outsource manufacturing. So, you know, there is, I'll just take the last one or two questions and I'll summarize. They're very long questions. Uh, another elephant in the room uh, is not part of the topic, but you might just want to give a 60 second uh, response. Uh, funding winter uh, is someone will ask as usual. And, uh, uh, you know, in, you know, in a nutshell, is a long question. Uh, we, do VCs have appetite for patented technology, you know, which take a long time? Yeah. yeah. So I take uh, the first question on uh, the funding winter. Uh, like I said, you know, things have been externalities change. You know, obviously, we as VCs uh, will also get impacted. I think various factors have led to this funding winter. One was just irrational exuberance during the last two, three years. Uh, where a lot of money went into a few sectors and a few companies, and uh, which uh, led to maybe uh, you know unsustained growth. Uh, so I think the funding winter is at early stage. I don't think Nenad, you and I are seeing any change, right? We are seeing many many companies. It's difficult to keep up actually, and many micro VCs have come up, many family offices have come up. So I think early stage there is even funding. The funding winter is in the next stage. So because I think people are asking more rational questions on growth, on growth at what cost, at what pace, um, I think a little more uh, diligence is being done. So just on, on a PPT or just on Excel sheets, one is not getting investments. But if you have a good idea and you can show adoption, I think money is there. I think a lot of funds have raised a lot of money which has not been deployed. Um, it's a little bit cautious. So I, I would not like to say that winter is going to be infinite. I think the there is going to be recalibration both at the investor end and at the uh, founder end. I think founders have to be more, dif more disciplined. Investors have to be more uh, sort of diligent uh, on and practical. We have to remember that in the Indian economy, we talk dollars that, oh, you got a million dollars of funding. We are a rupee economy. Our spending power is not in dollars. So people are not going to spend, uh, you know, $10 of ARPU. That's a lot of money. We are going to spend in rupees. Yeah. The economy is a rupee economy. So I think the investors, I think also we are guilty of mis being misled or being, you know, misleading founders in expecting the same growth. We are a large country which is growing uh, in terms of consumption, but it is also a very layered economy. We, the middle class is growing, but the ARPU, the average income is not growing at, the, at a dollar rate. So let's just reflect on who we are and where we can grow. We have a lot of growth potential, but it's going to take time and it's going to uh, take a little bit of rationalization uh, how much money does a consumer have to spend? How many brands will the consumer buy? Uh, how much food will the consumer order? Uh, I think we need to sort of relook at that. Um, and hence, we cannot compare a model which has worked in China or in uh, Japan or in the Western Europe and expect that to work and grow it at the same rate. The Bharat economy will grow at the Bharat rate, and that's a huge, huge potential. 
So I think we should recalibrate in terms of growth expectation, in terms of ARPU expectations, and valuations have to reflect that as well. And that's what the founders also have to understand. So the found funding winter, I think, just means rational valuations and more diligence on your business models. Uh, now, coming to the second question, which was on uh, the, there was a funding winter question and the appetite for patent long term, right? Yeah. Uh, Sorry, patented technologies. And patented all. technologies. So, there are specific funds who have a longer term mandate. They are also more geared in terms of their teams to evaluate patented technologies. Uh, for example, we look for patented technologies, or but the technologies must have depth. They must have the team which can commercialize this. I think the missing piece in India is the commercialization piece. We have a lot of government labs. We have a lot of uh, private researchers who can develop uh, technologies or products. I think the missing piece has been thus far commercialization, which means you require some uh, corporate VCs or corporations to come in, step in, and help in commercialization as well as help in early adoption. I think I've done one session on CII on this, uh, where CII is a great platform for corporates. And I think if they can take cognizance, uh, this is happening a lot again in the climate tech space or sustainability or energy uh, decarbonization space, where uh, this is required now to really make a good. Um, headway in these sectors. We do need uh, true research, we need patentable technologies, and we need adoption. We need to have partnerships with corporates and with uh, uh, you know industry partners across board to really push this. The VCs by themselves, you know, we are generalists, right? So unless they are very specific VCs, unless we can pull in partners who will substantiate the technologies and help in commercializations, VCs will, there'll be a small, small sliver of VCs. Uh, but this, again, I see in India, this is changing, there is appetite, because I think the whole cycle of manufacturing is happening, uh, supply chain is happening, cross-border is happening, uh, and sustainability is coming across sectors, which is pushing for innovation, which requires uh, technology development. So all these are good levers, which will unlock, I think, a good deep tech ecosystem. Great. Let me ask you a last question. And uh, you know, if you have any closing thoughts after that, after you respond to my question, that will be great. Uh, so if there is a new angel investor wanting to invest now in startups, is this a good time? And what word of advice do you have for her or him? Look, I think for angel investors, uh, sort of a winter as it is being called is actually a very good time because there is more rationality prevailing. Uh, the FOMO that is there, uh, I think last few years is sort of ebbing because the worst thing an angel investor can do is invest because of FOMO. By FOMO, I mean that, okay, this person invested and he made 100 crores or whatever. So I must invest and get that kind of return. Uh, otherwise, you know, I feel like I'm left behind. I think that's completely wrong reason to invest. Uh, this is a right time for angel investors actually to understand what truly early stage investing means. It means having patient capital. It means understanding uh, what the startup is aiming to achieve over three years and not like get an exit in, in like three months. Uh, it means that you work collaboratively in the ecosystem uh, and see where you can help the startup with your experience and take them to the next stage. Um, without having this fear of, oh, somebody else will come and take it away from me. I think angel investor is there to uh, stay alongside the investor, the founders, to help and to guide and to not have this kind of a rush, the gold rush way to invest. So I think it's a very good time for an angel investor to really understand how this ecosystem works and how one can actually uh, I mean, you know, Renard Law Fund invests in very many companies, and then you find a few gold nuggets. And that, that's the reason uh, we are called angels, that you have to take the risk, and you take measured risks um, in not just one or two companies, but at least in a portfolio approach. So you invest in a, at least five or seven companies, and one of them will give you outsized returns. But several others can give you 
reasonable returns. So I think it's a very good time. Valuations are reasonable. I think startup founders have also understood that one can't just um, expect any amount of money all the time unless you are yourself disciplined uh, and you're focused on why you started the company. It can't be for valuation. It has to be for value creation. Uh, and the angel investor must also understand that valuation is just a number on paper. Till the company becomes valuable, the valuation has no meaning. And that message is very clear in today's world. Uh, so if you talk to VCs, everybody's talking more, uh, more about value creation uh, and actual matrices, uh, which, uh, which are your business 101. So I think a uh, great time to be an angel investor. We need more. So I think do connect with Nirad's fund. I think they will uh, connect you with many founders. No, thanks, Paula. I think that's a great way to end. Uh, it's a great time to be an investor. She has given so many nuggets, you know, in passing, she mentioned about uh, company startups should become valuable and not just chase valuation and many more, many more. I have learned a lot in the last 35, 40 minutes. Uh, she's actually given four specific sectors, you know, and believe me, it's not very easy to get a VC to pin down uh, to four favorite sectors. It's always general, but she's given very, very specific uh, four sectors. She's given a lot of thoughts on uh, how to look at investment. And finally, she has mentioned that this is the right time. Uh, so thank you again, Paula, for joining us. I just want to uh, say one last thing. You know, you when you introduced me, you said that we look at companies which will make social and environmental impact. So we always we believe that entrepreneurs really impact society. So we really want to support entrepreneurs or take the risk. Uh, I think it's a good time to be conscious about the environment and support companies, take a little bit longer bets on companies which are doing things sustainably. Uh, and I think every entrepreneur creates impact. So we should uh, continue to support. Uh, and uh, I think platforms like CII must bring in more people who can uh, really bring in more partners for the startup ecosystem. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, Paula, for joining. Those are wonderful closing words. Uh, a message there, not just pure investment, but a real, uh, very impactful message. Thank you again for taking your time. This was an amazing session, and I hope uh, we can continue to engage with you. Thank you. Over to you, Harish. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. Thank you for the session. Thank you, Nair, sir. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye.